Hello and welcome to Brian Moore's Full Contact with The Telegraph. We're now two weeks into the 2026 Nations. England are off the mark with a win over Scotland in a game that, to be honest, many will be happy to forget. Much of the talking points after the game surrounded England's try-scoring prop, Ellis Gensh, who hit back at his critics in his own inimitable way. Eddie Jones backed him up, I think. As for Scotland, well, that's two defeats in a row, and uh, Gregor Townsend, the head coach, is under a bit of pressure to make matters worse. The exiled fly-half Finn Russell lifted the lid on his feud with Townsend on Sunday morning, hinting that a return to the squad was not possible with Townsend at the helm. Former Scotland winger Tim Visser knows both men very well, and he'll join us to reflect on the defeat and talk about the latest in that saga. Ireland won the battle of the new coaches in Dublin, Andy Farrell and Wayne Pivak went head-to-head. Ireland captain Johnny Sexton says they're hoping to draw a line under the last two years and their old regime, and we'll speak to the former Ireland second row Mike McCarthy, who was at the Aviva, to find out what exactly has changed, if anything, under the new coach Andy Farrell. Plus, we'll be answering all your questions, as usual, including the potential addition of South Africa to the Six Nations competition after reports that they are looking for an entry to make it seven nations from 2024 onwards. Alongside me today to discuss all this and anything else which he wants to bring to the uh, party, delighted to welcome back the former Sevens captain and now rugby multimedia man, Rob Vickerman. Hello, Rob. Hello, Brian. Good to hear from you. Good to see you. Uh, Look, difficult to take anything from the Scotland-England game in some senses because whilst it was never in danger of being... Uh, called unplayable because of the danger factor. If you were at that stadium and you saw the way the weather deteriorated, I'm saying to people, if you just watched on TV, I promise you it was close to being practically unplayable beyond a few basic skills. Well, you were there and obviously yes. able to still use your mouth, which is always handy. Obviously not as cold as you've been previously where <laughs> yeah. it does get to the point where you can't talk. But yeah, certainly didn't look great, did it? I mean, I actually watched it down the local pub just for that kind of ambiance and get that, that environment right. And, and to be honest, it's amazing how much of the public is captured by the Six Nations. It's just a real shame you see it in those conditions and, and there's nothing we can do about that. But in terms yeah, just, of... Just as an uh, interest, just interest, what was the prevailing... Um, wisdom from people who are not really rugby people but do watch Six Nations because that's what the only rugby I like to watch. What did they think of the game as a game? Yeah, well, I guess on behalf of the six million people that casually watch the Six Nations that know much about rugby, a little bit of confusion, if I'm honest. Um, I do think it's one of those games where if you're not that nuanced with the laws and the contests and the line-outs and things like that, it can be quite confusing. So in a way... Difficult because there's no audio, so your fine self wasn't heard uh, on the on the screen. But in terms of explanations, there wasn't much visual to go by. Like if you're watching it casually and you're seeing that many kicks, and realistically, the, the ball was only in play for 33 minutes. Oh. It's not a great spectacle, if I'm completely honest. And uh, nothing we can do. Well, about this that. is the point I've been making to people, and rugby aficionados or or just fans, they say a lot of them are saying, "Oh, it was a gripping game. It was uh, forced the players to go out of their comfort zone because there were no." set plays, etc., etc., etc. And I was simply saying, if you want rugby to stop, well, not to be, it will always be a minority sport to football, but to grow, you cannot have games which are like that, which are virtually unplayable. They've got to find some way, whether, whether it's moving the, the, the thing which I've raised again to the summer or playing it at the end of the season or having a roof subject to cost and viability and so on. That sort of, Fair, if you watch it for the first time, probably wouldn't make you watch again. No, and that's the fear, isn't it? I guess as rugby nuts, we'd watch it anyway. You'd watch it even if it were if it was sleet snow. But I think the wider message is exactly that. And I think, you know, we're not going to the whole politics of it. You see and hear about the suggestions of a, of a globalised calendar, about playing tests in the right time. There's, there's no getting away from the fact from November till probably late February, April, rugby's not a great spectacle because they can't play. And, that, and that's at the top end with the skill sets far beyond most people's capability. I was then followed up with a mini rugby. You know, I've got an eight-year-old son, soon to be. And again, like you take nothing from it. The kids are beyond nithered. Like, they're cold to their bones. Mm. So I do think there's definitely discussion there. But I guess in terms of the context of the game, also, it was a huge game, which could have been decided completely either way. A chance, you know, it wasn't a spectacle where skill came to the forefront, more so just brutality. Well, there were lots of talk about Eddie Jones' selection. 
Turns out whether or not he was going to do it anyway, which I think he was, the 6-2, six, 6-4 two, six with two backs, yeah. on the day, that particular day, was even more prescient or fortunate, whichever you want to say, because it cried out and it, and it definitely made a difference, didn't it? The size and the power of the forwards that England were able to bring on, nearly all of them, it just tilted the balance slightly. Yeah, it was, it was a big talking point from the World Cup when South Africa did it. And I've been sat next to them as a reporter for the World Cup. You just saw just how ginormous those men were. So bringing them on, the sheer weight and volume, and that was in you know reasonably acceptable conditions. So where a game such as that, weight counts, power counts. And just to give you a few stats on it, because I'm a nose, England's type five, one to five, made 70 tackles. Scotland's type five, just 26. So in terms of not only the mentality of knowing someone's on the bench that can replace you, you empty the tank more. You know you've got that confidence that you can go all out because of the 6-2 split and you know whether his hand was pretty much made for him with look, looking at which players were available. It came to fruition that the lineouts were dominant. You know, you get, again, front five who are firing. Scotland down at 58% lineout success. So all of these factors that are huge when it comes down to those conditions were all in England's favour. England won 11 turnovers. Scotland just won two. So fair play, Eddie. Good call. Let's have a look at the back row. Um... Uh, many people, including me, have questioned the well, the logic of the Curry experiment. I only made the point that if he truly believes he's a long-term replacement, he maybe ought to be playing him now in front of Billy Verpool because uh, with Billy's injury record and so on, who knows whether he'll make that there. I, 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 I'm not sure this isn't one where Eddie's just been a bit obtuse. Frankly. Well, it's the whole experiment, you know, you, you use that word really liberally in some environments. This is elite level rugby in a must-win game and you're putting a guy who all, you know, all areas would say he's an out-and-out out seven and if he plays with his brother, you might look at a six and a seven. I mean, I've got nothing wrong with it as a spectacle to put someone like that as a number eight. I just think you've got to change the whole balance of the team. So I, I kind of get why he's calling an experiment. I would loosely use that terminology. If his long-term thought is that, then why the hell has he got Willie Hines playing, who's 34? Like, there's well, no... you moved on to that. I was going to move on. You did it without me. What about the scrum-ups? Next generation, succession. Yeah, and I've been lucky enough to work on a few of the under-20s championships with World Rugby uh, for the last four years, really. And you're seeing there, single-handedly, France dominate. And you're looking at it now. I mean, everyone's saying DuPont's come out of nowhere. He hasn't. He's been around for a while from that 20 scene. Uh, Demba Bamba, same. Like, huge personalities, as well as good players, uh, and to Mac, another one, just to, to reel off another. Uh, I mean, they've got an absolute plethora of talent in their back line, and that's not including the Fijians that I'm bringing through as well. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in terms of the, the wider scale, I think the 20s is a good indicator, so the French looking good. If you're going to look at the England team, Harry Randall's been the standout for the 20s at nine. I don't think he's going to be quite pushing for international selection. I know size isn't necessarily a factor for all players, but he is he's proper tiny, so that will hinder him slightly. But you're exactly right. For me, you look at who's going well, and, and I listened to your, your pod with with Chick Chalmers last week and the Ben Spencer debate just keeps going back into your mind. Like, what else does that guy have to do for a shot? To the point where it might be 27, 28 when he gets his chance. Then you're thinking, well, you've limited his career. You know, it's really strange situation to not think about that. Got Mitchell as an apprentice who sits in the wider squad not wanting to get capped although Zach Mercer was in that grey area where he almost did. Um, So that's clever to have them there. But then why not involve them? Like, you've got, you know, all credit to him. What a career Ben Young's has had, but... You know, he's well, I mean, with Spencer, I understand that the doubt is whether he can be sufficiently dominant uh, and so on because of what Eddie has seen uh, close up in training. But that doesn't necessarily mean he couldn't do it, wouldn't do it, as he seems to be able to do for Saracens in a game. And the only way to find out is to try him, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I feel for Daddy, Daddy Care getting that old man tag. He's not 31, 32, so he's still not, you know, Heinz's age. So, yeah, I think there's a big question to ask that. I'd love to ask Eddie. I know you're privy to some uh, circles with him. It'd be good to get his thoughts on it. Mm. It seems the more visceral the media get towards his selection, the more he is rebellious against it. So I don't know where Eddie's head's at with that. Do you see anything different two weeks' time? It's a big game against the Irish. They must be very confident, but they are coming to Twickenham. And uh, home advantage in the Six Nations has been shown quite conclusively to make a difference. So it'll be fairly even, I think, when they go into the game. Um, any distinct changes, do you think? Or is it going to sit with a 6-2 bludgeoning thing? I think from England's point of view, it will stay largely the same. I know Simon Amor is the, the now attack coach. will have a bit more time in better conditions to try and get his team ready for 
that attack. And I think it's going to be a great game, first and foremost. I fear a little bit, like the sideline story will be the whole father and son debate with the Farrells, yes. which is going to happen. But even already the post-match interviews from, from the Wales Island game, those questions coming in at them about saying, how will it be taking on England and your son? Thinking, well, they're two very different things, aren't they? Two very different questions. So I think Ireland are hitting that form, certainly on watching their game against Wales. They were outstanding. And they've got a back three to challenge anyone's and that's exciting and their game plan Lama is, is playing watch. very well isn't oh, it? so good I mean Conway and Stockdale as well it's really big players at the right time and they just do the basics so so well and you got Sexton again post game saying our game plan is to get them the ball which is exciting to hear and you're probably not going to get a better tactitioner and executor of that game plan than a Mike Cat overseeing it all so for me it's going to be a cracking game you know the fellas should both say this look we're really competitive we always have been Father and son, I wanted to beat him when he you know, was my dad, as it indeed is, is actually the case. I say, of course I want to beat him, and he wants to beat me, and we'll see. And yeah. then that will solve it all. Yeah. Everyone knows that's right. Oh, and, and they kind of come out and saying that, you know, they're obviously saying, <laughs> as Owen was to Sonia post game, it's the case of putting that aside, but just get it out of there, go early with it, and exactly. say, yeah, I'm playing against my dad, he's been beating me at chess, ch- uh, checkers, tennis, tennis exactly, table tennis. Yeah. Cluedo the lot since age five. I want to smash him. Of course I do. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it was a difficult game at uh, Murrayfield and it wasn't the side's fault. Not a lot. Uh, Genuinely, very little they could do about it. And I I stress this again. You had to be there to understand how difficult it was even to pass the ball 10 yards. It was going all over the place. What was worse, the game and conditions or the commute home? (laughs) It was probably a bit of a draw, to be honest. It's two losses now, uh, ultimately, for Scotland. Um, why don't we get the thoughts of the former Scotland winger, Tim Visser, who knows a lot about the personalities involved. Uh, hello, Tim. Hi there, how are you doing? All right, mate. Um, difficult to take an awful lot out of that because the weather was so awful, but the indisputable fact is Greg has now got two losses uh, in this tournament and he hasn't got Finn Russell, did you, I don't know if you saw f- the article uh, and the interview with Finn, and if you uh, did, what, did, what did you yeah. make of it? Well, I think I think it explains a little bit about what has been going on between them. Um, initially, this event obviously was portrayed as you know, Finn having a couple of beers, falling out drunk with his head coach, and then leaving and not coming back. But there's also a lot more behind it. Um, they've not seen eye to eye for a long time, and I, I think this was a bit of an excuse to let that get to a head. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that one of our best players in the country isn't uh, playing in one of the biggest tournaments that they ever play in. Um, and it would have been fine if, if we would have been winning. Uh, and actually saying that Hastings has been, he's actually been really quite good. Um, the difference being that uh, Finn is, is an established world-class fly half who's probably in the form of his life right now and Hastings is is still very much learning on the job not saying that he hasn't done a good job but the difference is obviously still there and, and that's nothing to nothing to say that that Hastings isn't a good player right now well Townsend hinted that Russell could come back for the next game the Italy game but it seemed to me that uh Russell had a, a more a wider or wider agenda of it's him and me. Now, just on a basic level, you, you, you can't have a player saying that for me or whoever he is, but I, 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 mean, I just don't see any way out of it if the views are this entrenched. What, 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 will, what will break this, do you think? I don't. Well, I don't actually know, and I agree with you. you know, however good a player is, you cannot hold um, a coach, and in my view, therefore, a team to ransom. Um, and... Uh, I think if there if there was to was to be a choice, and I don't think there is one right now, then you would, as as an SRU, as the the governing union, you'd have to back your own coach, obviously, because you can't undermine the whole ethics of the team and and the the organisation over a single player. Um, but saying that, there, I don't think there is a choice from, and I also read the interview. I don't think there is a choice right now. Um, it doesn't look like Finn um, wants to come back right now. Um, I don't know whether that it, that interview was slightly overstated. Obviously, the media can run away with things uh, sometimes a little bit, but um, 
I even I don't even think it's something to, to worry about right now. You know, as a coach and as a team, you have to you have to focus on on the task at hand. And the task at hand is the fact that they've lost two games and they're now going into an Italy game. And actually, if you if you look at how Italy played over the weekend, they look really dangerous. And we have to go over there and do a job and uh, and get something out of that game. Hi, this is Vix here. Just just going back a step from the the Italy preview. Um... In terms of experience of that you've had in Newcastle, Scotland, Edinburgh, Quinns, really senior leadership groups, what point yeah. do you think that they take a lot of ownership as the management of the culture and how they put the messages across? Because it can't all be on Gregor. No, and I, and I think that's actually probably what's happened here. Um, from from what I've heard, it was actually the players that you know, asked Russell to stop drinking that particular night, uh, and, and I think eventually that's why he left the hotel. Um, I also think. I've also heard that you know the, the players kind of made the decision that you know he probably shouldn't be coming back until the whole issue is resolved. Um, and I, you know, I think there is a strong leader group with, within that team. Uh, obviously, Hogg having stepped up as captain, but there's many, many more players behind that which which can lead that. Um, and yeah, like I said, the, the issue you have with, with with stuff like this is that if you let situations like this uh, seep into the team, it's, it's, you know, it's like a cancer. It's going to spread. And if one player thinks that um, he can do certain things in the team, and, you know, bear in mind that Finn Russell is, is one of the best players, I mean, probably on the planet right now. The stuff he's doing for Racing is unbelievable. But you can't let that lead your decision onto how to treat certain players because, as I, as I said earlier, you know, once one player thinks he can do that, uh, it's going to spread like wildfire. And before you know it, your whole team's falling apart. So you, know, you have to back Gregor. You have to back the, the players' group. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, that they need him right now. Tim, one of the things that could uh, break this on pass is that, uh, that Gregor goes. Now, given the performances so far... Uh, if they were, to, if it was to go wrong in Italy, there would be a, a certain number of people who are saying, "Well, if the way through is this, um, let's get rid of the coach." Is is that a possibility? I mean, it would be. It would just in the fact of the matter, it would be a solution. Yeah, it, it would give the S R U an excuse to uh, to get rid of Gregor, and which therefore would lead uh, to to getting Finn back into the system. Um, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily. The solution right now. Uh, I, from the short career I had under Gregor, I thought he was an excellent coach. He's, he was a very good man manager with me. Um, even though you know he stopped selecting me at a certain time, I've always liked him as a person. Um, he's obviously a well-established coach. Um, you know, let's not forget that the issues Scotland are having uh, has plagued them for many years. It's not necessarily coach bound. Um, but yeah, like like you just suggested, the, the 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 matter of the fact is is that if he does leave or is asked to leave, then that would solve that particular situation. Um, but again, I don't think that's the solution to to everything right now. I think you're probably right, Tim. Thank you. Great to speak to you again. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on. No worries. Bye bye. The, the the other thing, when Tim was hinting at that, as a player, if you've anything about you. You understand how important someone like Russell is. But if he gets his way, I personally would be thinking, wait a minute, this is obviously one rule for him and not for me. And I don't like that. Do you know what? I've, I went a bit wide on this, Boro, and, I, and I, I wrote a bit of a piece a few months ago about how rugby gets it wrong because they can't manage a maverick. And I know people have been listening to this podcast to are chief execs, senior leaders in businesses, and they've got that sales guy or salesperson who's just an absolute moron, but they deliver. And they consistently deliver and they produce some of the most magical moments. But you know they're going to take up 80% of your time managing them. And, and for me, you look at NFL, you look at any type of American sport, they almost accept that they're personalities. And they're comfortable enough as managers and as people to manage that. And it's part of it. I think rugby hangs itself up on these morals and everyone's proud about, you know, you can go to these values the game holds. Absolutely. But in an era where we are scrutinised more so than ever in social media and from the media's point of view, getting in at him and that, wanting that article, and it's probably underpinned by the All Blacks being so successful with their you know, well-defined mantra, which I won't go into. But it comes to the point where you have to actually cherish that. And there's so many people in business and certainly leadership that get it right, that encourage this maverick, knowing that they can contain it and, and accept that. And, and for me, rugby sometimes really frustrates me. Because Finn Russell, as Tim just said, one of the best players on the planet. They manage him. 
one of the ways to do that is to make him captain, actually. I was about to say one way, and I say it this with a, with a bit of a background in leadership, uh, looking at how it's not transactional leadership, it's more transformational leadership. If you want to really cherish that person and let him know what you're going through and how it can impact the rest of the team, then put him as a captain. Get him facing the media. Get him be the one galvanising the team. And it would be transformative for Finn Russell to see that. I'm all in. That would be such a good management tool. Well, if it comes off, we can take credit. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> this Six Nations don't do things by halves. Turn to The Telegraph for unrivaled insight from legends of the game. Join Sir Ian McGeeken, Brian Moore, Will Greenwood and other rugby greats to follow every dramatic moment. Subscribe to our sport package today from just £1 per week at telegraph.co.uk. Well, next up for England and Ireland is a clash between the two, but uh, Ireland probably a form team of the tournament so far after their quite convincing win last Saturday in Dublin against the Welsh. Let's speak to Mike McCarthy, the former Ireland second row about it. Hi, Mike. Hi, lads. How are you doing? Not too bad, mate. Um, look... Impressive way for Farrell to start. Uh, he's got uh, second winner's coach. He's picked up the bonus points. I'm not that sure. We've seen a huge departure from what Schmidt was, save possibly a little less reliance on um, going forward via the kick chase. Uh, a lot of it is still, to me, the good old island way of you know being very, very physical at the breakdown. What do you think? Yeah, I was at the game. It was a uh, it was a cracking display by Ireland. Uh, you know, they got off to a good start, beating Scotland in the first game, and you know there was a lot of pressure on them uh, with being Andy Farrell's first game. Mike Cat obviously coming in to evolve the attack from Italy, but uh, I think you have to remember, and the fans have to remember that when Joe Schmidt and Declan Kidney took over, uh, they took over during the Guinness uh, uh, the Guinness series, so they had three games to kind of find their feet for those three games. Whereas Andy Farrell's came come straight in right at the deep end, uh, starting with a 10-day preparation window for, for Scotland. Uh, I think it was just a relief to get over the line, win that first game against Scotland at the Aviva, and to see where they've come in a week, scoring four tries and getting the bonus point, um, and a, a really comprehensive performance. Um, the weather conditions were pretty bad there with Storm Kira on the way. Ireland were playing into a, a pretty strong wind in the first half, and they had the wind against them uh, in the second half. So, you know, it was a, it was a great display, and um, you know, some key key guys have uh, have left the team after the World Cup. The likes of Rory Best, Rob Herring's come in and played really well. It's been great to see Dev Toner back after missing out in the World Cup. He was the most capped player under Joe Schmidt. Um, so, and you know, Johnny Sexton as captain, he you have to remember he was out for ten uh, eight to ten weeks before the first game against Scotland, and he's played two games of eighty minutes and. Uh, you know, led the team incredibly well. So it's it's very exciting going into uh, the next game, obviously England at Twickenham. Hi, Mike, it's Rob here. Just trust you to talk up Dev Toner given any chance. It's a classic you. Um, oh, but in not, terms not of the way the Irish are going, <laughs> yeah, th the three kickable penalties were turned down notably in the first half. And I just wonder, from coming from Joe Smith with a man with a plan to the nth degree, yeah. Farrell's give that little bit more of an expression to the players to kind of fabricate their way. Uh, what's been that kind of acceptance from the players do you think having a new guy in charge and a new way of playing yeah Joe Joe was in charge for seven years and uh, you know I think f for all Joe achieved uh, you know and we know all, all about that when Joe came in I think Ireland were ranked eighth when, it, when he, he got them to number one in the world but you know perhaps during the World Cup their, their game plan didn't evolve uh, became a bit stale teams worked them out you saw last year Six Nations when they played England at the Aviva when they played Wales at the Millennium Stadium uh, Wales and England just dominated them physically, and you weren't used to seeing a, a Joe Schmidt coach team uh, lose that physical battle. But you know, last year they did, uh, and you know against Wales, it just came out, and that physicality was there. The, the foundations, the dominance up front, from uh, from the from the scrum, the maul, uh, the collision winning, whether whether they were carrying the ball or defending, it was all there, and that that kind of um, filtered out to everyone else, allowing everyone else to play well. But in terms of uh, kicking to the corner and not taking to the post. I think it's just uh, a statement of intent. And, uh, you know, Andy Farrell, he's, I, I was in one camp with him, but it's, you know, it's well known. He's, uh, he's a great motivator. And I'm sure that was the plan going into the week that it, it's just uh, start the game. Well, get the crowd behind you, a statement of intent and, you know, kick the corners. Let's take them on physically. Let's, let's take them on 
uh, up front and 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 get that parity to to win the game. So, you know, they, as I said, they've only had ten days together. It's pretty difficult to make. I think uh, the Irish public are very expectant and were, were wanting to. They were very disappointed after that Scotland game, which they won. But he, he's only had ten days, and it's going to be small, gradual changes. Uh, they're not going to reinvent the wheel uh, in ten, 10 days, so uh, it is going to take time, but I think it was a cracking uh, display against Wales. So, Mike, as a final question, uh, next up trip, trip to Twickenham, always more difficult playing away from home, historically being shown time and again. What are you expecting to see from Ireland in that game? Yeah, I'm. Uh, well, the, the, last, the last time they played there was uh, the, the pre-World Cup warm-up game, and uh, you know the wheels really fell off for Ireland in that game. I think uh, they got they got absolutely hammered. So they have some pretty bad memories of that game. But saying that they did win there pretty convincingly in 2018 when they won the Grand Slam. And you know for me they'll they'll be going with a lot of confidence now. Uh, the Scotland game uh, a great performance against Wales, and it's kind of pretty similar to 2018 for me because when Ireland played them at Twickenham won there, uh, England were missing Vunapola and Tuilangi, and for me they're two huge players clearly but th- those two players really make make that English team tick in terms of uh, the momentum the gain line the go forward they give the team every time one of those guys carries the ball they draw in three or four defenders and it just creates a lot of space on, on, on those wider channels so uh, for me with those two guys missing um, I think England will be you know obviously they understand what a tough game it's going to be at, at Twickenham but you know, they'll, they'll take a lot of belief from that game in 2000, 2018 and, uh, you know, they'll be hurting. Uh, they'll be a, a bit a bit like a caged dog, you know, going down there in terms of they've, they've, uh, they've, they've not, they've, they had a shocking performance there the last time. So I'm sure they'll be going down with, uh, you know, a lot of confidence, but also understanding it's going to be incredibly tough. So you're right and subject to weather, I'm sure it'll be a cracker. Mike, uh, thanks for joining us, mate. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Uh, Wales, um, bit of a bit of a, a, a bumping. Um, uh, although you couldn't say that Wales were out of the game. I mean, they were put out of it eventually. Um, do you think the missing Edwards? I, I they just the, to me when they've got the players back. I think at the moment that I don't think the centre partnership's working quite as well as the well the, the trusted one of Parks. And Jonathan Davis, and I think that's always going to have an effect, you know, in attack and defence. And I don't think the back row is playing as well as it looks on paper. It hasn't quite gelled for me. Yeah, I think there's again some stats that kind of back it up. So Parks going into the game was heavily criticised. There's a lot of pressure on it. He's come out as top carrier. I thought he had a decent game. Yeah, he did all right. And I think that sometimes happens. Some players know there's something on them and, and they have to try and prove a point. So he carried pretty hard. You think about that no try, 55 minutes, if he'd have scored it, 19 14. Very different scenario there. Um, but I do think, you know, the way that Wales are now attacking, which is different, you know, when would you ever seen Wales uh, string three passes together, get it to Alwyn Jones and the outside centre channel, him offload it to bigger? That wouldn't have happened. So the transition of style certainly is coming through. I know with Pivac and also Jones now cementing himself since the World Cup. It's going to take a bit of time to change it up. I think Actually, look at it. They probably only had two attacks in the first half, multi-phase, in Ireland's, well, third they scored from one of them. Another one was shamefully knocked on when they, an offload came through. So I like the way they're changing their style of play. You know, gone are the days Warren Ball was the talking point after the game, albeit it was successful. And I think that that's going to take a little bit of time to come through, not just for the fans' expectations, but for the players. I mean, by way of explanation, you're looking at the way that New Zealand probably started this, having Reed and then uh, Taylor Cook, the hooker, on the other side in the channels as either a carrier or a support player, or a cleaner, or something. You've got something similar with Fallot, haven't you? And I don't know whether Jones is there, uh, Alwyn Jones is there by accident or design, but you've got big players now seemingly positioned and you know in that sort of role. Yeah, and it's moved on a bit from the classic pod rugby, where you'd have yeah. literally four men attacking in almost a diamond formation, three or four passes out from where the ball's been played from. So I do think that's going to you know change the format and and mo. Probably momentum more so because you want quick ball. You're going to get it if a big guy's running a small guy out wide. And, you know, that offload itself really shows that there is space there. And as teams now defend a rook more, more so than ever, you're committing like seven men in the first two passes. There's going to be space out there. But previously it was a case of battering through it for Wales rather than having a bit of expansion and 
playing around it. And, and that's to be welcomed. I think it's, yeah, Pivac's certainly showing what he did with the Scarlets and those two at the helm. For me, it's really exciting for Welsh rugby because you're going to see some fantastic rugby being played. Well, before we uh, go to the questions, let's discuss uh, France. Look, I mean, you have covered a lot, as you say. You've seen a lot of the nascent talent that is now emerging in France. And my point was always, that, uh, to be fair, they've always had a lot of talent coming through. They've had a great deal of difficulty picking it, picking it in the right positions, and then carrying on picking it. And if they've brought the solidity selection-wise with Galtier doing that, and you can see the... And it is true, you can see a, a more relish in defensive uh, tactics than I've ever seen with, with, a, with a French side. If you've got that, that bodes well. Now, I'm still waiting for, the, for something to go wrong because <laughs> so I've, seen so, I've seen 30, 40 years with a French coaching and selection and at some point they've always done something utterly, utterly bizarre. But it might not be the case this time. I offer you hope, Moro, because I, I was reading one of the Telegraph articles on this and since reading it really sparked my interest. So I spoke with a few people in New Zealand and get this, okay, Ibanez, your old mate, the old uh, talismanic hooker, for France, took three months out of the World Cup, didn't go to Japan to watch their team. He got three months sabbatical from the FRU to head out to New Zealand, where he took his family, lived out there, and coached the team in the ITM. So immersed himself in New Zealand culture, absorbed everything he could in terms of learning styles, and came back with a really thick notepad and went into the details about what's, for him, the most impressive thing about New Zealand and New Zealand rugby. Number one was sharing. He could not believe that the top coaches in the country were sharing information, details, strategy, game plans, data, insight with every single level of coach. And, and it was actually Sir Ian McGeekin that used to go on about this a lot when I was with them at Yorkshire. It was all about making everyone better, not just making one team better. So that's something he's, he's stored in the back of his mind. Another thing was the ability to have relationships, to build those relationships and have clarity. So what he's done since coming back to France, and this is a guy who's you know touted to be the next sports minister of France, such as his um, reputation out there, He's gone to each and every one of the top 14 clubs and had a conversation with them and said, look, this is a nation. This is something we want to be part of. How can we work together to galvanise this team and make everyone proud of it? And you're thinking, that's quite a scary entity. If you get all the French teams and their power and talent, as you say, going in the same direction, galvanised by this very charismatic leader who's you know got wonderful English skills, which help. I don't, like, I don't like what I'm hearing here. No, it's not good, is it? This is what I'm scared about. <laughs> and above him, you have Laporte, who's managing it soon to be um, potentially you know, involved with the World Rugby Echelons with, with Sir Bill Bowman. He's making it paramount that only French players will contest the jersey who have a passport. So again, bringing this galvanisation to a French team who invented the word, uh, it's quite a scary thing. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of the under-20s over the last few years. France 2023 now, for me, is a really interesting proposition. Home World Cup, you'd be hard pushed to back against them. What do you think about the rate of introduction? Because you, you, you cannot just give an under-20s team that comes through the free reign. You've got to have the experience there. At the moment, um, they are erring on the side of youth. Do you think there's a possibility that they get carried away with that? Because you still need the, the gnarled forwards, the experienced backs. And they've got them as well. It's just a question of, again, being cute, isn't it? Yeah, well, to be honest, looking at their front five, they're absolute monsters. Um, they, they're, again, players who are the gnarled forwards. You're never going to get a set of French forwards who aren't gnarled, probably just trying no, to contain no, them for anything else. Right. But I quite like the fact they're throwing a couple of Saffers there as well with LaRue and Valencia, who, again, are just horrible human beings, exactly what you want from your second row. And then they've got that ability to pick those athletic, very gifted, but talented back rowers. So for me, the French proposition is really exciting. And the thing we should be most scared of more here is that Sean Edwards does implement what he has done at every single environment he's been in. Because yeah. if they get that right, as you saw in the first 20 minutes against Italy, that was scary because you're getting big men looking fit, looking aligned and shutting down space. You're thinking, right, well, And I'll tell you what, the, what, what they've got as well is there was one point in that game when Italy started to come back into the game and they almost looked a bit bored to me as if, do we have to do this, etc.? And then you've got one or two players who are individually brilliant and just do things and click out of that and create things seemingly out of you know very little. 
And when you've got that as well, and that, and once that clicked, then the team came back into this. And Italy, there was a point where Italy, if they'd gone ahead, I think the, there'd have been doubts again and so on. But they've got still, and we've always known this with France, it's been so frustrating for me watching teams not even bother to try and uh, emphasise this with very, with huge flair, whatever you want to call it and so on. And if they can uh, augment that within, you know, a structure and an effective structure, then that, that doesn't bode well for other people. No, and you've got, again, coaching team who, who understand that and they've kind of grown up with French rugby, they've played a lot of it. So their mindset is very much, we've got a French way of playing. How do we tap into that more? And for them, I guess the key word always, with all French rugby is consistency. How do you do it at home and away and do it for... That's the point, time? away. Yeah. Never been... Well, no team is as good away, they're just not. I mean, again, it's that's a, a matter of statistical fact. But with the French... We will see. Um, it's not an easy uh, place to go. Sell a V. Uh, Sell a V. We'll yep. What would, what would you, I mean, if you had to put money on it, because the Welsh probably need, well, they need the win more. Um, what do you think, that, how do you think it'll play out? <sighs> to be honest, I think the French have the edge. Looking at how they're playing, look at their um, certain talent that they've got across the board. I think Intermax coming to a rich vein of form and he looks comfortable playing with DuPont. I think they've got a real belief about them, I guess different pr- principle completely played away. For me, I think the big game, I know you've featured this in coming weeks up, but the France Island game, the 14th of March, that's going to be an absolute cracker. Last one of the three, 8pm. That could be a massive moment for French for French Ooh. rugby, going forward, certainly. That, that gets me going. Well, uh, time to go to some questions now. Um, why don't we get one? James Newton, how would you go uh, about winning a game of rugby in Saturday evening's conditions? Uh, my view is very simple, James. You do exactly what you can. And I tell you what, there's lots of people saying, these are supposed to be talented players. How can they not even kick a ball? It's only a bit of wind. Let me tell you this. I was saying to Chris Patterson, who was Scotland fullback for years, and he told me, in these conditions, down the far side, there'll be a strip of about 10 yards where it'll go one way. When you come inside that, it will go the other way. When you're in the middle of the field, under your post where Scotland defending the first half... The wind would be very much against you in the middle and on the touch and there'd be a strip when it wasn't. And he said the problem is it differs between five yards. So it's all right saying you've got to appreciate where you are and so on. So all this nonsense about, you know, they're supposed to be skilled players. I tell you, it was it was close to being impossible to make. Yeah, I don't think it was probably helped by the fact that it was the same three styles of kick that all went out in the full. So almost, yes, we need box kicking are going to be a feature. They're going to be if you're picking Willie Hines. But then maybe look at something a bit different, perhaps a shallow one, perhaps on the floor, just something a bit different that the casual viewer, obviously watching it, would be it's thinking. It's amazing how many uh, how many expert kickers suddenly arrived. Yeah, I was going to say. If only you do it, it, you kicked it along the floor. Well, that depends on a lot of things. A, there being space. B, you actually actually identifying the space behind as well, uh, and, a, and a lot of other things. Well, um, there is space there because the fullback was deep enough to, to isolate that space. The point is, if you put it to the, the elements, then the element's going to take control of it. If you control that, yeah. as best you can, then that's why I'd potentially say look at something a bit different. Uh, and again, playing at Newcastle, as soon as it went above the stadium on the on the south yeah. side, it could go anywhere on the whole pitch. Yes. And you mitigate that circumstance by knowing where to put it. Great. John Theo, South Africa, in or out of a six-stroke, seven nations championship. Well... This is problematic for me in lots of senses. Um, they've always said there's not enough room for seven teams. If they do find room, how? Player welfare? I, d- I don't know. Uh, yes, South Africa, time zones and so on. No problem with that. Huge name, huge uh, impetus for the tournament and so on. What does that do for rugby championship, though? Well, that's the big question. I think there's probably another podcast in itself talking about this because Sanzar as an entity is is really struggling because you've got your pressures in Australia trying to build their game. New Zealand, believe it or not, are border winning. Their whole country are really resenting rugby at the moment, which is an alarming thing to say. And then you've got South Africa and who both feel those, a bit both those unions, well, particularly Australia, are not in a great financial state. It's, it's, Australia are close to being bankrupt. Yeah. New Zealand, not, not not so, but you know, it is not the uh, bean feast that everyone thinks. No, and I've just been to New Zealand and Australia in the last two weeks. So you see it firsthand, it's really quite staggering. You think of these teams with such success 
in rugby for New Zealand and sport in general for Australia, you're thinking, well, how can they fail? But they are. It's really failing. TV rights are all up in the air as well. So they're trying to find this great solution about what they can do with Sanza. How can you separate teams? I mean, Argentina in that rugby championship is nonsensical. That is brutal for, for logistics. South Africa, whilst I love the thought of going to Cape Town in February, wouldn't necessarily work either logistically. So I think there's far better options if it were going to be contested, perhaps looking at Georgia, how they could compete. That relegation element to it would change the Six Nations. But at the same time, you've got CVC as an investment company who wants stability. So why would then bring in a chance to change that? So there's so many conversations around it. And you know, far be it from us in this room or to try and come up with a solution for it. But I do think people are looking for something a little well, we bit different. We can throw them about. You know, people will consider them. All I would, th- th- this is the main point I would make I- 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 as a final thing on this point, is there are no easy solutions. If you're sat there thinking, oh, just do this, there'll be other consequences all round. The really, I- and, and better brains than mine have tried to look at this, and they tell me every single move you make, there are there are pros and cons, and they're big both ways. Yeah. So there isn't, you can't just say, oh, do this, do that. The butterfly effect. Exactly, yeah. absolutely. Um, do Scotland have, uh, this is still here, do, you, do Scotland have the players to be anything more than fifth in the Six Nations this year? Well, they were, they were third last year, I think, but they were of England last year. But uh, look, <laughs> once you start off with two, two losses, that, you're, you're in trouble. You're, yeah. you're in trouble. I mean, the, if, if it were to go wrong in Italy, it, it would really would be, there would be so much pressure for, and I think wrongly, to, to get rid of Gregor Townsend. So, you know, we will see. They just need to, they need that win, come what may. Yeah, and Gregor Townsend is a performance coach. So whilst people talk to him a lot about results and clearly he's judged by that, he's a performance coach. He'll say himself that it's about getting that play in the right mindset to get that team in the right way that, that are going to benefit to best win, not necessarily be so focused on the result. Um, which I realise is a very difficult place to be as a head coach. I think on the face of it, there were two games where Stuart Hogg drops a ball over Ireland, very different scenario. And then Groundhog Day, here we have that one. Same thing against England. You know, you're looking at a very different situation. They're, they're not... You've been, I, you have been in that situation as well. You've been in. People don't believe that I played fullback, but when you're thinking, please go, just do, please go over the line. And then at some point you've got to think, if I don't drop on this, I know they're chasing players and one of them dives... I'm like a complete idiot. Well, that's Patrino. Yeah, Rob, uh, Rob exactly. Howley. So you've uh, just got to try. And, uh, you know, from the resultant scrum, that's what, that's what happened. Um, I don't think they're far off, Scotland. And I think everyone's talking about it. But you do have someone like Finn Russell that can galvanise a performance. If that gets solved, then potentially they have got the players. I don't think they're far off. And you need off. a bit of luck as well sometimes, you do, don't yeah. you? Especially in those conditions. It's probably yeah. 90% luck. OK, well, that's all we have time for on this week's Brian Moore's Full Contact with the Telegraph. Can I just give my congratulations to Emily Scarrett, the great Emily Scarrett, who's become the highest ever point scorer for England women. At the point I'm looking at this, England were 53 nil up, uh, and that was the 77th minute, so a big, big win for them. As indeed it should be, because they are you know, far more freshly organised, they have better resource. But, Emily Scarrett, what a star you are. Thank you to my co-host, Rob Vickerman, and to all our guests. I'll be back every Monday evening during these Six Nations from all the usual places you get your podcasts. So if you've enjoyed this episode or any of the previous episodes, please do subscribe, tell other people, and we'll catch up with you next week. For now, goodbye.